little bit about the, <clears throat> excuse me, the appendicular skeleton. And there we go. Okay. So we completed the axial skeleton. You feel pretty good. At least I hope you're feeling pretty good about what the axial skeleton entails the skull, the vertebral column, and the thoracic cage, the rib cage there. And so now we're going to talk about the appendicular skeleton and all the bones that are that comprise the appendicular skeleton. So our upper and lower extremities attach onto the axial skeleton through another bone or other bones, I should really say. And we call those bones the girdle bones, all right? So we have, for the upper extremity, the pectoral girdle. For the lower extremity, we have the pelvic girdle. So we're now discussing the, the, the appendicular skeleton. It's not just the upper extremity, but it includes the upper extremity and the bones to which the upper extremity articulates with. And the same goes for the lower extremity. So the pectoral girdle right, includes your upper extremity and, well, let me rephrase that. Hold on, hold on. All right, there we go. Okay, the pectoral girdle is going to be the bones that actually attach your upper extremity to your axial skeleton. And it's comprised of the clavicles and the scapula. These clavicles are known as, oh, you've heard me refer to them before, as the collarbone. I will no longer refer to them as the collarbone. I will no longer refer to your shoulder blade as the shoulder blade. I'll refer to it as the scapula. So it's these bones that are going to attach your upper extremity to the axial skeleton. So let's start off with the clavicle. The clavicle is the easiest bone to fracture in your body. And it's the most commonly fractured bone, I should say. And so it looks like the letter S. <clears throat> and so it attaches onto your sternum, specifically the manubrium. We now know what the manubrium is. It's the superior portion of the sternum. And then it attaches onto the scapula directly to what we call the acromion. Sometimes it's called the acromial process. So the clavicle is basically, fun fact, the only actual bone that holds your upper extremity, your upper limb onto your axial skeleton. It actually has a, a, um, a direct bony articulation with the axial skeleton because the scapula does not really have a bony articulation with the axial skeleton. It floats around on top of some of your soft tissues on the back of your rib cage there. So here you can see the, the clavicle. And extending back from the sternum here, back towards your um, acromion back there. And that creates the acromial clavicular joint, which we'll talk about here. So the end of the clavicle that is going to be articulating with the sternum to form the sternoclavicular joint looks like a triangle, also described as pyramidal shape. The other end, which is more flattened, to me it looks like a spoon, right? <clears throat> that part of the clavicle is going to articulate with the acromion, and that's going to form the acromial clavicular joint. You may have heard it referred to as the AC joint. So we're looking here at the clavicle. You can see the sternal end, here it is, that's going to be the pyramidal shaped end. And then over here, the acromial end is flattened. So like I said, I think of a spoon. All right, so there's a couple structures on the clavicle. The only structure that you need to know for lab is the conoid tubercle. It's gonna sit on the underside of the inferior surface near the acromion. Then we'll also have the costal tuberosity. The costal tuberosity, you don't need to know this for lab identification, but you should still know it. It's going to be on also on the inferior side, right? And that's where this first rib comes in close proximity, right, to the clavicle. So here you can see the costal tuberosity right here. 
and then the conoid tubercle is this little bump. When we do the labeling part, which we probably won't do tonight, um, I'll point out the conoid tubercle. Notice the spelling, please. Okay, C-O-N-O-I-D. There's another structure that we talked about earlier on in the axial skeleton. Okay, that was called the, uh, give me a second, the coronoid uh, process. And that was that sharp fin structure that was on the mandible. So again, that's why spelling is very important. We're gonna see some other words here briefly that have similar spellings. So really work on learning the correct spelling for these structures there. All right, so how do you tell the difference between the sternal end of the clavicle and the acromial end of the clavicle. The sternal end is going to be closer to the sternum. It's gonna form the sternoclavicular joint, but it's gonna be more triangular or pyramidal in shape. Then the acromial end, that's gonna be the broad flattened end, and that's gonna articulate with the acromion, making the acromioclavicular joint. So since we've been talking about the acromion, let's discuss the scapula, your shoulder blade. It is a flat bone, it looks like a triangle, okay? And so you'll be able to see it quite easily right, on the posterior portion of your back in the superior area, the thoracic region there. So these three views here, you should become very familiar with these views. <clears throat> the top view is a lateral view, all right? The bottom left view is the anterior view. And then the bottom right view is going to be the posterior view. That'll be the view that you see when you're standing behind somebody in line to get pizza at a football game. Okay, so that is the posterior view. Now, if you notice the anterior view, all right, this part of the scapula, the body, that's all pretty smooth in there. But in this fella on the posterior view, that is not smooth. That's this big ridge structure. We'll talk about that in a moment. <clears throat> okay. But what I say to folks, and it's real easy, think about it. When this bone is on your back, it literally sits on top of some of the muscles there and other soft tissues. And it's just held in place by all these muscles and also by uh, the clavicle. All right. But would you rather have a nice smooth surface of the bone against your back? Or would you rather have this big bumpy thing brushing against your ribs on your back? I'm hoping that you're thinking this is the ideal, that one. And you'd be correct. That's why that's the anterior view. It's nice and smooth. Okay, so let's talk about some of the anatomical landmarks and structures on the scapula. So we have the spine, the acromion, and the coracoid process. Again, look at the spelling, coracoid. So the spine is gonna be that ridge that I circled here. That's the spine of the scapula, All right? At the very end of the spine of the scapula, you have the acromion. There it is on that view. Here it is on the lateral view. You can see part of it on the anterior view right there. That's the acromion. And then the third structure is the coracoid process. The coracoid process comes off the anterior part of the scapula. This is the anterior. This is the posterior on our lateral view. Here you can see the coracoid process here. And you can see it here. So keep in mind, all right, so the spine is going to be on the posterior portion, it's that ridge-like structure. At the very end of the spine of the scapula, you'll have the acromion, also known as the acromial process, and that's going to join up with the clavicle to form the acromioclavicular joint. Our coracoid process comes off the front, it's an anterior projection. And the coracobrachialis muscle attaches onto the coracoid process. So it's a site for muscle attachment. All right, we said that the scapula is a triangular bone. So there's three sides to a triangle. Well, the scapula has three borders, superior, medial, and lateral border. So again, 
from the names, the superior is going to be that top border there. The medial border is going to be the, the part, the border or the edge of the scapula that's closest to your spine. And then the lateral border is going to be the edge that's closest to the axilla or your armpit. <clears throat> then when we're looking at the scapula, we have these depressions, these areas here. That's what a fossa is. It is going to be a shallow depression. So we have three, excuse me, four fossas, the subscapular fossa, the supraspinous fossa, the infraspinous fossa, and the glenoid fossa. So looking at the first one, the subscapular fossa is gonna be found on the front of the scapula. That's right here. This right here is the subscapular fossa. And there's a muscle that sits there. It's one of the muscles of your rotator cuff. There's four of those. So the first muscle that we're going to talk about is subscapularis. That muscle sits there on the anterior of the subscapular fossa. Now we flip the um, scapula over, right? Then you have a fossa here in the superior portion of the scapula, and it's above the spine. So we call it the supra spinous fossa. Then we have another fossa below the spine here. And that fossa sits below the spine, so we call it the infraspinous fossa. So in both of those fossas, we have muscles, and both of those muscles are part of your rotator cuff. Rotator, we'll talk about the rotator cuff when we get into the muscles, right? But it's a group of muscles that help to add stability to your shoulder, your glenohumeral joint. So the name of the muscle that sits in the supraspinous fossa is called supraspinatus. And the muscle that sits in the infraspinous fossa, we call that muscle infraspinatus. Then our last fossa or cavity is this fella right here. That's the glenoid fossa or the glenoid cavity. And the head of the humerus, which is the proximal epiphysis, is going to articulate right there and that's gonna form your glenohumeral joint. Okay, so keep in mind, fossas are going to be depressions. So the subscapular fossa is found on the front of the scapula, on the anterior portion. Subscapularis stays there. And then our supraspinatus fossa and the infraspinatus fossa are found on the posterior aspect of the scapula. Supraspinous is above the spine. Infraspinous fossa is below the spine. And then our glenoid fossa or cavity is going to be found on the lateral aspect there. Okay, and that's gonna be the area that articulates right, with the head of the humerus. So what fossa are located on the scapula which is located in each fossa? All right, so I just went over that. All right, so that's our pectoral girdle. Those are the muscle, excuse me, the bones of the pectoral girdle. So now let's discuss the bones of your upper limb. Now we have to discuss a few things, first of all. Most of the time when people talk about the arm, they're referring to the, the entirety of your upper extremity or upper limb. That's gonna change now. We're in anatomy and physiology, so we have to get our nomenclature down correctly. So when we talk about the upper limb, right? we're gonna break down the upper limb into different components here. The part of your upper limb that is found between your elbow and your shoulder joint is called the brachium. That is your arm. Okay, the, the part of your upper limb that's found from your elbow down to your hand, is that is the antebrachium or your forearm. <clears throat> and then your hand is your hand. All right, so when we're discussing the bones of the upper extremity or the upper limb, okay, in your brachium, you have one bone, the humerus. In your forearm or the antebrachium, you have two parallel bones, the radius and the ulna. The radius is more lateral, the ulna is more medial. Then in your wrist, you have eight short bones called carpal bones. The palm of your hand, you have five bones called metacarpal bones. And then your actual digits, your fingers there, 
you have 14 bones in your fingers. And we call those bones phalanges. Now, I'm not a mathematical genius, but if I take five and divide it into 14, it doesn't come out to a clean whole number. So that means that one of my digits, okay, is going to have one less bone than the other digits. Your thumb has two phalanges in it, and the rest of your fingers, fingers two, three, four, and five, your index finger, middle finger, ring finger, and pinky, they each have three bones. So let's start off with the first bone of your upper extremity, and that's the humerus. Okay, this bone is going to form the glenohumeral joint with the, sca with the scapula, the shoulder joint, approximately, and then distally, it's going to form your elbow joint with the radius and the ulna. Here you can see the humerus from an anterior and a posterior view. The image on the left is an anterior view. The image on the right is a posterior view. I want you to be familiar with that. Okay, so let's talk about the parts of the humerus, some of the landmarks. So the head of the humerus is what we call the proximal epiphysis. Okay, keep that in mind. The head of the humerus is the proximal epiphysis. And so that articulates with the scapula to form your glenohumeral joint. On the proximal epiphysis, right, or the proximal end of the humerus, you'll see two noticeable bumps. One's large and one's small. So the greater tubercle is going to be on the lateral portion of the proximal end of the humerus. The head is going to be medial, so the greater tubercle will be lateral. Then you have the lesser tubercle that sits on the medial portion of the proximal end of the humerus. And there's a little groove between the greater and lesser tubercle. And so we call that groove after those two bumps, the intertubercular sulcus or groove. And it's worth noting here, this is where you're going to see the tendon of the long head of the triceps brachii muscle. Very often that tendon gets injured or irritated, you get tendonitis, and people will complain of shoulder pain. And they'll think that the sh there's, their issue is actually somewhere in the glenohumeral joint, where it's actually that tendon is in such close approximation to the joint that it's often confused and people don't really pay attention to the biceps brachii, which is that muscle that sits on the front of your arm. So if you recall from a lecture, we discussed the anatomy of a long bone. You have the diathesis, which is the shaft. You have the uh, proximal and distal epiphysis, which are the knobby ends of the bone. Then you have the area of transition between the epiphysis and the diathesis, kind of like where the bone starts to narrow down. That's called the metathesis. That's where we see the epiphyseal growth plate. Well, in the humerus, the humerus is a funny bone, okay? Because its epiphyseal growth plate is in an odd location. And I'll show you this later on, right? So where the epiphyseal growth plate occurs, it's not technically where we see a tapering of the bone down into the diathesis. So that's called the anatomical neck. Traditionally, the, the neck is going to be the metathesis. Okay, but in the humerus, it's different. So when we actually see that tapering down or that narrowing of the bone on the humerus, we call that the surgical neck. And that's clinically significant because that's where you can fracture the bone most commonly. All right, so then as we move down into the diathesis of the uh, humerus, we'll see a bump. It's on the lateral part of the humerus there. That's where the deltoid muscle attaches onto. And that's that muscle that gives you that rounded contour to your shoulders. And we name that bump after the muscle. So we call that the deltoid tuberosity. So now we're going to go all the way down to the distal end of our humerus. And we're going to see a couple different structures there. So let's start off with the bumps on the side of your elbow. So if you go down and you feel the bone on the inside of your elbow, that's most commonly called the funny bone. Okay, and then you can see that's on the medial part. 
That is your medial epicondyle. That's clinically significant because your ulnar nerve travels right behind the medial epicondyle. The medial epicondyle is much more prominent, it sticks out further. That's why you can, it's easier to palpate. If you feel on the outside of your elbow, you can feel around, you can feel a bone on the outside there on the side, that's your lateral epicondyle. Epicondyles are just sites for mus muscular attachment. Okay, so if you see the term epicondyle, then you should immediately know, okay, I know that muscles attach onto there. Whereas with the medial epicondyle, right, there's muscles that attach onto it, but also the ulnar nerve travels right behind it. So additionally, on the distal end of our humerus, we got a, a couple other bumps or structures there. Actually, we have two curved surfaces. We have the capitulum, which is this ball-like structure. It articulates with the head of the radius. And that's one of two bones in your forearm. It's the lateral bone. That's the bone that's gonna be on the side of your pinky. Now, excuse me, on the side of your thumb. Then you have the trochlea, which is gonna be more medial. And so it articulates with the ulna. And that's the more medial bone that's gonna be on the side of your pinky. So the trochlea, to me, it looks like a a bow tie, something like that, okay? So the capitulum is like a ball, the trochlea is like a bow tie or a dumbbell, however you wanted to, to imagine it. So here you can see in the distal portion of our humerus, you can see the medial epicondyle. See, it's pretty pronounced, pretty big. The, the lateral epicondyle is over here, it's much smaller. So on the distal end here, you'll see these two structures. Here's the trochlea, and then you can see the capitulum. All right, also on the distal end of the humerus, we'll have some depressions there, and we call those fossa. Now the fossa are important because they allow for bones that articulate with the humerus it allows those bones to get a nice close uh, um, uh, approximation without damaging the bone. If you didn't have these fossa, you wouldn't be able to bend your arm, all right, as easily as you can, and you wouldn't be able to extend your arm all the way out. You'd be lucky if you could bend your arm past uh, 60 degrees there. So the radial fossa and the coronoid fossa, okay, we saw this term before, coronoid, we saw it up in the jaw, in the mandible there, okay? But both of these fossa are gonna be located on the front of the humerus. The radial one is gonna be lateral, because that's on the thumb side, because it's going to articulate, or it's going to accommodate the radial head. And the coronoid fossa is gonna be medial, and that's going to accommodate the coronoid process of the ulna. And then if you feel on the back side of your elbow, you'll feel a, a bone there sticking out in the back side of your uh, elbow. That's called the olecranon process. Okay, or the olecranon. And so when you are extending your elbow, part of that olecranon is gonna get really close to the humerus. And so we have the fossa there. So it allows for part of the olecranon, all right, to move into that fossa so you can extend your elbow almost all the way out to 180 degrees. Without that fossa there, you would only be able to extend the elbow out to about 120, 130 degrees. So thank goodness for the fossa. So the radial fossa and the coronoid fossa, both of those are going to be on the anterior view here. The olecranon fossa is going to be uh, on the posterior aspect. All right, so you can see here, here's the capitulum, that's that ball-like structure, and it articulates with the head of the radius. Now, the head of the radius, all right, if we're looking down at the top of the head of the radius, it looks circular like that, but then there's this depression there, and the capitulum sits right inside of that depression. 
So if we're looking at it from the side, the head of the radius here, all right, there'll be this depression. And that's where the capitulum sits right in there. And that allows the, the head of the radius to swivel around. We'll talk about why it does that in a moment. Then you can see over here, here's the trochlea right there. All right, a couple x-rays of the elbow. You can see a nice A to P view, and then you can see a nice lateral view. All right, A to P stands for anterior to posterior view. All right, difference between the anatomical and surgical neck of the humerus. The anatomical neck is where our epiphyseal plate used to be, and that's where it fused together. The surgical neck is where we see the narrowing of the actual bone of the humerus. And it's clinically significant because it's a common fracture site. All right, so what portion of the humerus articulates with the radial head? That's the capitulum. And then the portion that artic articulates with the trochlear notch of the ulna is going to be the trochlea. Again, you don't know some of these terms and, and we'll go through some of those. Okay, so let's get into the forearm here. So in the forearm, that's the part of your upper extremity that goes from the elbow down to your hand. And so we have two bones, the radius, which is the more lateral bone and the ulna, which is more medial. They are parallel to one another. So you can see here when we're looking at the bones that the ulna is the longer of the two bones. Okay, much longer. And they're parallel with one another. So keep in mind, the radius is always going to be on the same side as your thumb. And the ulna is always going to be on your pinky side. So we're going to name veins, arteries, and nerves after those bones. So if you hear of the, radi the radial artery, then you're gonna think, oh, all right, that's on the thumb side of my forearm. If you hear the ulna artery, that's gonna be on the pinky side of your forearm. So get to know that now, it'll save you a lot of time later on. All right, so let's start off with the radius. Okay, the radius, we're gonna start at the proximal end of the radius there. We talked about it before. The shape of the radial head all right, is a disc. So if we're looking down at it from the top, it'll look like that with that depression inside. Okay, but that disc is the head and that articulates with the capitulum. Then the head will start to taper down. All right, where it starts to taper down, that is the neck. And as we go down a little bit onto the diaphysis of the radius, you'll see a bump there. It's pretty prominent. That's called the radial tuberosity. And that's where your biceps brachii tendon attaches to. That's an important anatomical landmark. Some of you might already know this, especially if you have to take blood pressure. All right, so if you palpate out and you can feel it, I'm feeling mine right now, right there on the front of my elbow, okay? I can feel the, the biceps tendon there. And what you'll do is just go medial to that, to the inside, head towards your funny bone. Okay, so you're going to go in about maybe about a half an inch to an inch and put your finger over that area and you should start to feel a pulse in there. Well, that's the pulse, that's the brachial artery. That's the pulse that they use to palpate and listen to your blood pressure. So they put the blood pressure cuff on your arm there, and inflate the cuff, okay, and they stop the blood there momentarily and they're listening with the stethoscope. All right, that is where they're going to be listening. So it's important that you know where the biceps brachii tendon is so you can palpate it out. At the far end of the radius or the distal end of the radius, you have two structures. You have the styloid process. Again, we've seen a styloid process before when we were uh, talking about the temporal bone there. It's a, it's a bony projection. And then you'll have the ulnar notch. So the styloid process is going to be on the lateral side of the radius there. And in fact, if you go down and you feel, if you put your fingers on both sides of your wrist, you'll see, you'll feel a bone on either side, right on, your, uh, on the base of your thumb there. That's the styloid process of the radius. 
the ulna has a styloid process on the on the on the medial side. Okay. But on the medial side of the radius, you have the ulnar notch. And that's where all right, the ulna kind of tucks itself up against the radius there. So we call it the ulnar notch. All right, the ulna, the second bone there of your forearm, the longer of the two bones, doesn't have as much going on as the uh, radius does. Okay. But in this case, all right, when we're talking about the proximal end of the ulna, this is where you're going to find a couple structures. You're going to find the trochlear notch, the olecranon, and the coronoid process. So essentially, the proximal end of the ulna, this is going to be a horrible drawing, but it looks like almost like a Pac-Man. That's not too bad. So the coronoid process is this structure right here. Then this big old structure on top, that's the olecranon. And then this little notch right there, that's the trochlear notch. And so the trochlea, that is part of the humerus, fits nicely into that notch. And so that makes up part of your elbow. And so the part of the olecranon that you feel on the back of your elbow is over here. Whoops, I forgot to mention the head and the styloid process. At the other end of the ulna, way down here, okay, you'll have this little nubbin, and that's the styloid process. So that was your, that's what you're feeling on the um, pinky side of your wrist. And then you also do have a radial notch on the other side of the ulna, opposite the styloid process. Okay, and that's going to accommodate part of the radius. So you may have noticed on the picture here, in between the ulna and the radius, it's colored in green here, but we saw it previously here as a white kind of sheet. And that white sheet, all right, is made up of dense regular connective tissue. We call that the intraosseous membrane. And what it does is, and this is hugely important, it creates a joint, and we're going to learn about what type of joint this is in chapter nine, right? So I'll get into it more then, right? But what's important is it keeps the ulna and the radius at a fixed distance from one another. And that allows for a pivoting of rotation in your forearm. And we're going to talk about that now, okay? But it's important that you know this. Right? The intraosseous membrane is made up of dense regular connective tissue. That's some of the strongest tissue in your body. It keeps the ulna and radius at a fixed distance apart from one another, so they're not squeezing in. And it allows for rotation all right, of the forearm. Because, yes, there's tissue here, but there's other structures in here. You'll have muscles. All right? You'll have some blood vessels in there and nerves. And so we can't afford to have those bones pinching in on one another. So that intraosseous membrane, all right, is going to provide, all right, that separation there. All right, so that leads me into this uh, motion and movement called supination. Okay, so we're going to start off, remember, when we're talking about if something's medial to something else or lateral to something else, we're always using the anatomical position as our reference point. And so I hope you recall what that is. Standing. Um, feet flat on the ground, standing, looking straight ahead, arms down to your sides with your palms facing forward. That's the anatomical position. So when you're in the anatomical position, your palms are going to face forward or anteriorly. And that means, all right, my thumb is on the lateral side. So that means my radius is lateral, my ulna is medial. And they're nice and parallel to one another. Take a look, okay, or as best the parallel can get. All right, so now your arms are to your side, your palms are facing forward. How I remember this position is if you take your hands and bring them together, like you were going to drink out of your hands. Say you've been wandering in the desert for four days, you come across an oasis and you kneel down and you start scooping up the water with both hands and creating like a bowl with your hands and, and drinking the water down. 
Okay, that is supination. And how I remember that is if I'm going to hold soup in my hands, that's how I have to position my hands with the palms facing upwards together. And so that means that the forearm bones, the ulna and the radius are parallel to one another. So that's supination. Pronation, again, is going to be the opposite. So now instead of the palms facing anteriorly, the palms are going to face posteriorly. So if I have my hands in that cup position, drinking the water, now all I have to do is turn both of my palms down towards the ground. Look what happens to the bone. Look at the radius. Here's the radius and supination. They're nice and parallel. Look what happens to the radius now. Boom, crossed over, okay? The intraosseous membrane allows for that, but also up here, the capitulum, that rounded ball structure. Remember I told you there's that depression there in the head of the radius. Well, it swivels right on that. And so the intraosseous membranes allows for that pivoting point. And now the palm of your hand is facing posteriorly. And so we've crossed the radius on top of the ulna. Pretty cool. One more time. Supination, radius and ulna are parallel. Pronation, crossing over, okay? That movement is specific for the forearm. Okay, so let's move on into the wrist where our carpal bones reside. Remember the carpal bones are short bones. They're about as wide as they are tall, roughly. So there's eight of them. And so we have, they have, they line up in two rows. We have a proximal row and a distal row. Okay. Okay, so take a look. Silly lovers try positions that they can't handle. Folks, I am not big into mnemonics, okay? It was just never my thing. Some of you like mnemonics and there's nothing wrong with that. If it helps you to learn, I'm down with it, okay? As long as it's not hurting yourself or hurting others, okay? So this is one of the few mnemonics that I remember from med school, okay? And it was funny because I used to watch a show on NBC called uh, ER, and they actually use the same mnemonic in an episode of ER when the med students were trying to learn the carpal bones. So silly lovers try positions that they can't handle. What you do is, is you're going to take, all right, the, hold on one second, get rid of that. All right, you take the first letter of each of these words and that matches up with a carpal bone. So silly, S, scaphoid. Lovers, lunate, tri, triquitro, and so forth and so on. Okay, so this first row, this first four words here represents the proximal row. And we go from lateral to medial. So the lateral is always starting on the thumb side. So the scaphoid is going to be at the base of your thumb. All right, so silly lovers try positions that they can't handle. It's just a, a way if you want to learn how uh, the 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 uh, carpal bones are. Okay, we'll go, well, I'll go through these specifically uh, when we do the labeling. All right, so just something to kind of keep in mind. We'll go through all these in much more detail. So the bottom row down here, all right, these are, that's the proximal row. The proximal row is gonna be the row that's closest to your forearm bones, to the radius and the ulna. And so you can see the scaphoid there is at the base of the thumb right here. All right, lunate, triquetrum, and pisiform. So those are your carpal bones. So the metacarpals are the bones that are going to be in the palm of your hand. And so they're going to articulate with the distal roll of carpal bones, and then they're also going to articulate with the proximal row of phalange bones. So how we name the metacarpals is that we use Roman numerals. 
So Roman numeral number one starts with a thumb and then Roman numeral five ends up on the pinky. So if we're talking about your index finger metacarpal, we would call that metacarpal Roman numeral number two. I don't know if you know the Roman numerals. I don't even know if they still teach them, All right? But not to worry, let me help you out. So Roman numeral one is like that. Roman numeral two is that. Roman numeral three is that. Roman numeral four is that. And Roman numeral five is that. That's how we do it. One, two, three, four, five. One is going to be on the thumb. Five is on the pinky. Middle finger, the one that you use to flip off the bird, is number three. And that's how we do it. Metacarpal one, two, three, four, and five. Easy, right? Good. Finally, something easy. Okay, so here you can see all the metacarpals. Those are the bones that are in the palm of your hand. Same as piano fingers. Okay. I didn't know that. I'd love to learn how to play the piano. I heard if you can play the piano, learning other instruments is a lot easier. I can play one song on the piano. And it's by a group called, and the name of the song is, So if you're not sure what that is, YouTube it, and then that song will be stuck in your head. It's not bad. No, it's not bad. <clears throat> okay, so there you can see all the metacarpals there. So always keep in mind, by the thumb, that's metacarpal number one. And then by the pinky is metacarpal number five, like mambo number five. <laughs> you should watch I wouldn't say watch the whole video it's from the 80s I heard it on the radio the other day it made me happy all right the phalanges the phalanges okay these bones are the bones that make up your digits all right so remember what I said there's 14 phalanges so one digit has two phalanges and the remaining digits have three phalanges. So if you know which is the exception, then all the rest are easy. So the only phalange that has, or excuse me, the only digit that has two phalanges is the thumb, also known as the pollux. It has a proximal phalange and a distal phalange. It does not have a middle phalange. So you could also say the thumb is the only digit that does not have a middle phalange. Now, when you are labeling in the test and learning this material, you notice here, this is the plural for phalange, okay? This is the singular for phalange, or if you want to, you can just drop the yes, and that's also singular. It's up to you, right? If you wanna call it a phalanx or a phalange, it's up to you when you're talking about a single bone. So let's take a look at some of these. All right, so here are all the phalanges. So you notice here on the thumb, there's only two. So every single digit has a proximal phalange. Every single digit has a distal phalange but only digits two through five have a middle phalange. Okay, please make sure that you know that. This is some of the easiest stuff for um, the, the, on the test. So you gotta get this easy stuff. So this picture here shows us all of the phalanges. You notice proximal, there's five. Distal, there's five. Middle, there's only four middle phalanges, digits two through five. Remember thumb is always number one, always number one. And then finally, clinical uh, uh, topic here, scaphoid fractures. I actually saw a patient in my office that had a scaphoid fracture. Um, I saw him this week, they had a scaphoid fracture a while back 
And so, of course, I asked them, what happened? Uh, did they have to undergo surgery? And they did not. Problem is with the scaphoid fracture, all right, this will happen if you start to fall and you land on your hand. Okay, and because of that, you can damage the blood vessels. And if you damage the blood vessels that go to the scaphoid, all right, and it cuts off the blood supply, we've talked about this before, necrosis, right? it's tissue death. You get avascular necrosis means the tissues have died because they don't have adequate blood supply. And so that's always a concern. So if the blood supply is okay and you fractured the bone, but there's, it's, it's not a significant fraction, just cast it, leave it alone. It'll take some time to heal, but good to go. Problem is, okay, you can have damaged blood vessels, then you have to go in and operate. All right. Folks, I think what I'm gonna do because this is as far as I got with my other class last night. I'm going to stop here.